This is CBC Here and Now. Tonight, shocking testimony. Al Potter admits to stabbing Dale Porter, but he says it was in self-defense. Our province's oil revenues are under review. Is Canada going to cut us a good deal? I'll ask the Premier about the Atlantic Accord. That's ahead. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Anthony Germain. And I'm Carolyn Stokes. Big day today at Al Potter's murder trial. He took the stand in his own defense, admitting to stabbing Dale Porter. But Potter says he's not guilty. Here now is uh, Ariana Kellen is standing by live and there is a lot to dissect here, uh, Ariana. So uh, you've been following this case closely all day. Uh, what did Al Potter have to say? Well, Carolyn, with shackles on his feet, Al Potter shuffled up to the witness box, placed his hand on the Bible and swore to tell the truth, and he was not short on detail. He was animated, insistent, and at times dramatic as he reenacted what he says happened in the early morning hours of June 29, 2014. Now there's no denying Al Potter was here. Evidence presented earlier in the trial, like this cigarette butt, placed him at the crime scene. Now it appears to be a moot point. Potter says he went back to Dale Porter's home that night with Porter and Potter's friend. Things were fine, he says, until his friend asked Dale Porter to get some cocaine for him. Potter claims Porter's demeanor changed, and he began telling Potter's friend that he would sleep with his girlfriend. He says Porter also disrespected the Viking's colors. We can't tell you the name of this friend as his identity is covered by a publication ban. Dale Porter's sisters wept in the courtroom while hearing Potter's version of events. Potter tells the court he doesn't want to upset the family with the negative things he says Porter said. Potter claims he whipped out his own knife in defense of himself and his friend. Potter was animated as he reenacted what he calls a knife fight. Porter, he says, came at him first, and Potter says he tried to knock the knife from his hand but couldn't. A medical examiner has testified that Dale Porter was stabbed 17 times and cut four times. While he lay dying in his driveway, Potter and his friend got a cab back to this clubhouse in Cupid's where he checked himself out. Potter says he too was hurt. Upon cross-examination, he says he isn't guilty of any crime, at least not the way he sees it. As for the undercover operation which led to his arrest, Potter claims he was afraid for his life, that the officers would kill him and bury him in a shallow grave. And as for him knowingly joining a violent business, he says he was not aware. Potter says he went along with burying what he believed was a dead body because he felt he had to. Now, it's expected Al Potter will be the one and only witness for the defense. And now that the jury has heard that Al Potter stabbed Dale Porter, they'll soon get to deliberate his fate. Was it planned and calculated first-degree murder or merely self-defense? Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Arianna Kelland in St. John's. Progressive Conservative leader Chess Crosby says something's up with the Atlantic Accord. The opposition leader held a press conference today to raise suspicion over the ongoing negotiation between this province and Ottawa. Here now's Katie Breen was there and she joins us now live. So Katie, what did Crosby have to say? Well, his point was in semantics. Under the Atlantic Accord, he says Newfoundland and Labrador is the principal beneficiary of oil revenues off our coast. But Crosby says lately, instead of principal beneficiary, the government has referred to the province as the primary beneficiary. And he says that change in language is suspicious. For O'Regan, Ball, Cody, uh, Whalen, all of these people to start using that word in the last few months, something's up. Crosby noticed the language change in recent media reports. He didn't ask the Liberals listed what the difference meant. He just called a press conference saying the two terms had different legal definitions. The Premier was quick to shut that idea down. Some of the language has been interchangeable, and not just you know, by me in, in recent days, but it's been interchangeable for decades. The Atlantic Accord was first signed in 1985 and lays out this province's and Ottawa's share of the oil and gas revenue. Now the agreement is up for review. The Premier says this province isn't giving up its hard-fought position as the principal beneficiary of the offshore, 
but the opposition says it's hard to be sure of that because the Premier is negotiating with Ottawa in private. Our discussions right now are meaningful, they're productive, and I will tell you right now, on behalf of Newfoundlanders and Labradorians, I will stand up for the best interests of Newfoundlanders and Labradorians. No fear with that. When asked if equalization payments are on the table, Ball said a host of things are being discussed. Right now, anything, any place where the benefit to Newfoundlanders and Labradorians, that's what the discussion is all about. The Prime Minister was here in the province last week. He met with Ball then to discuss the accord. The pair are committed to having the review completed by March 31st. The Premier and the Natural Resources Minister will head to Ottawa Thursday to give the Senate Committee a presentation on Bill C-69, which deals with energy project assessments. Reporting live for Here Now, I'm Katie Breen in St. John's. I know yesterday was a storm day, but unfortunately there is more messy weather on the way. Just going to have a quick look at some of the watches and warnings in place right now. Wind warning for the entire south coast and up on uh, the northern peninsula east. Gusts up to 100 there tonight, including some snow squalls in those areas. A snow squall watch in place for the Bay St. George area and a winter storm warning for uh, the Cornerbrook area up through Grossmore and up to Parsons Pond. So yeah, it's going to be really messy tonight into tomorrow. We do have this wind warning in place for much of the northeast coast. That's for tomorrow night. That's when the winds are really going to start ramping up in those areas. And as for snowfall amounts for the west coast, we're looking at about 10 to 15 centimeters along the coast. But the upper regions, the mountainous regions, upper terrain should be seeing much more snow up to 50 centimeters in some areas. And we also have a snow squall watch for the southern peninsula, Avalon Peninsula, uh, Bureau Peninsula and uh, the Porta Basque area and in Labrador we have a blizzard warning for McCovic and Hopedale. Lots of snow possible uh, in those areas. 25 to 45 centimeters for tonight into tomorrow through to tomorrow evening. A winter storm warning in place for the Cartwright area, Eagle River and as well as a blowing snow advisory for the Norman Bay, Red Bay area. So lots of weather to talk about. I'll break it down in more detail a little bit later. Former Premier Paul Davis says his government was kept in the dark about cost overruns at the Muskrat Falls project. Davis was Premier during what has been described as a slow start for the project's main contractor, Estaldi, and he was also a cabinet minister when the project crossed a so-called point of no return. Davis testified at the Muskrat Falls inquiry today. Here now's Jacob Barker was there. He joins us now live. So, Jacob, what did the former Premier have to say? Well, Anthony Davis said that if he had known some of what he's been learning here through the inquiry, it may have changed key decisions uh, the government made uh, through the construction of the project. And he said that nobody in the government was informed of cost overruns even before that federal loan guarantee for the project was put in place. Once that was put in place, the project had to go ahead. And again, I stress, I don't know if the outcome would have been different, if the decision would have been different, but it certainly would have been a conversation well, and a discussion. Well, I, re I realize it's impossible to say what the outcome would have been, mm -hmm. but it, I, I'm suggesting that as a minimum, it would have caused government to pause and reflect on the wisdom of proceeding with this project. Is I that think a that's fair, fair way to put it? I think that's fair. An internal Nalcor email entered into evidence by Commission Council today also casts a shadow on the Crown Corporation. The email is dated just 10 days before the point of no return when the province secured its federal loan guarantee and it shows a rise in cost of more than $300 million over Nalcor's initial estimates. Do not provide to NL, the email reads, and marks the information confidential and commercially sensitive. This appears to me direction to make sure that access to that information is not, uh, is not provided to the government. Okay. And you can't explain why that would be... Uh... No, sir. David says when he was Premier, then Nalcor CEO Ed Martin told him about Astaldi's slow start and about rising costs and tight timelines, but never mentioned a 2012 report that gave the project a 3% chance of finishing on time. He may have used terms that uh, acknowledged that there was pressure on the schedule and there were challenges on the schedule, but I don't remember any numbers like 1% or 3% likelihood of achieving schedule. I, I, yeah. I don't have any recollection of that. 
Well, that questioning of Davis is just wrapping up inside the inquiry room now. Tomorrow we'll learn more uh, information about what was going on in the House of Assembly uh, while the project was in its construction when former Minister Derek Dolly takes the stand. Reporting live for Here and Now in Happy Valley Goose Bay, I'm Jacob Barker. And we'll hear more from former Premier Paul Davis at the Muskrat Falls Inquiry. That's coming up in about 20 minutes. Well, there are new details about the severance package for the top official who was in charge of getting Muskrat Falls power from Labrador to Newfoundland. Nalcor announced that John McIsaac had left the Crown Corporation a couple of weeks ago. And according to his executive contract, McIsaac is entitled to a lump sum payment or continuance of salary equal to 20 months of service plus benefits. McIsaac's base annual salary was $330,000 and he was also able to earn a yearly bonus of up to 24% of his salary. Well, the provincial government wants towns and nonprofit groups to put their heads together and come up with ways to make transportation more accessible. A call for proposals was announced today at the Metrobus Depot in St. John's. The government is looking to fund transportation programs aimed at seniors, people with mobility issues, or anyone who can't fully participate in their community because of lack of transportation. Grants of up to $100,000 are available, and the deadline to apply for them is March the 19th. The hope is that some innovative ideas will be brought forward. You might have an elderly person that would donate their vehicle and because they can no longer drive and then other people can offer to drive it for certain hours and we just need to step in with a little bit of support and help them coordinate things like that. It's not rocket science. It might just be a small bus that goes once a week to help with doctor's appointments, to help pick up groceries. There's many, many things that can be done and now that there's some financial support, oh, it's going to be wonderful and, and it will really benefit the seniors of this province. Well, there's more bleak news today for those invested in the province's crab fishery. This year's stock assessment from the Department of Fisheries and Oceans shows what officials had suspected. The snow crab biomass remains in trouble. Here and now, Cease Hare has the details. After the cod collapse in the early 90s, snow crab stocks flourished and crab was king. But the latest scientific assessment confirms earlier suspicions that the stock remains in trouble. Last year, the overall quota in this province was cut by almost 20%, and this assessment may be a sign of things to come. There's going to be high times in some of the areas, no doubt, because <clears throat> they have open give you what they like on paper. I mean, if the, if the resource is not there, you're not going to catch it, right? DFO's assessment also shows signs of improvement in some areas, but overall, it's not good. DFO Science is concerned about the stock health of the Newfoundland and Labrador snow crab. Um, we've seen some modest increases in the exploitable biomass in recent this year. Um, but if we look at the time series as a whole, the exploitable biomass remains at a low level. One area that's in serious trouble is 3L, the inshore sector from Bonavista Bay all the way down to the bottom of the Avalon to St. Mary's Bay. DFO says stocks there are seriously depleted. But fisherman Tony Doyle questions that. He says in 3L inshore in some areas quotas are landed, in other areas they're not. So he says lumping bays and coves together doesn't accurately reflect what's happening with the stock. To the north of Conception Bay, Bonavista and Trinity Bay, they're, 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 they're in a bit better shape than we are. And uh, Conception Bay and, and here off St. John's are uh, in the, in the, really in the, in the troubled area, I think. To that end, the FFAW takes exception to DFO's approach in coming up with its numbers, adding its members need to be at the table. Today's assessment now goes to DFO management, which will take it to the industry for consultation before quotas are set for the upcoming season. Cease here, CBC News, St. John's. Well, the province's latest lottery winner walked into the Atlantic Lottery Corporation offices today to pick up his big check. Yes, he calls it a surreal experience. Ladies and gentlemen, the man who won Set for Life, Adam Kreiderman. 
Yes, Adam Kreiderman of St. John says winning the lottery is not something he ever thought would happen. But today, the new dad picked up his big set for life winnings, a one time payout of $675,000. And Kreiderman says he can see a few purchases in his future, including a new pickup truck and a new house. And he's going to pay off some bills, but he says his top priority is taking care of his five week old daughter. At the end of a long day of work, um, got home, put the groceries away, went up to the store to get a few things and uh, picked up one of those tickets, got at home and uh, did the scratch. And, you know, I've been shaking ever since trying to let the reality set in. Oh, it's 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 just a it's a surreal thing. It's it, it means everything. It's the, you know, uh, setting up a family like I am. This offers a level of security and stability I uh, never thought was going to be there. So it's uh yeah, it means the world. That's awesome. Wow. Yeah. Five week old baby, mm -hmm. $675,000. I'm going to say okay. a winner on the young side of things. <laughs> uh, put that money into scholarships and all that for that five week old. I yelled and I, I whistled and I dug in the snow and I looked under vehicles and I, I truly felt that if he was there and he, he would have came. A 15 car pileup. And a CBS family that lost their Shih Tzu in all that chaos. We'll have Obi's story coming up after the weather. As a man in this country, that seldom is mentioned in song. And later in the show, remembering Chuck Lewis. The booming voice of masterless men who died Sunday after a cancer diagnosis. We'll look back at his career.
This weather forecast is brought to you by Newfoundland and Labrador Tourism. 5,000 kilometers of groomed trails are waiting to be explored. Embrace winter today. All right, lots of weather to get to. Yeah, but right. before we get to that, uh, someone on the island had some special visitors yesterday. Yeah, Katie Myers captured these big critters on video yesterday morning in her front yard in Portal Cove, St. Phillips. And as Ooh. you'll see, they're munching on the greenery with full delight. That's a real close up look. Yeah, the all you can eat salad bar <laughs> in Portal Cove, St. Phillips. She must be uh, very unhappy with her yes. bushes being destroyed. I just destroyed. planted those last summer. <laughs> oh, the and three, he's going pretty, for another one. Pretty bold. Yeah. Look at that. There they go. I think at some point they realize, uh oh, hey guys, we're busted. We're on the video. <laughs> the Iron Seal post this. Now, there we oh. go. And off we go. Shoo, shoo. Yep. To go and eat somebody else's plants and shrubberies. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Three big animals. Portugal Cove, St. Phil. All right. They didn't seem to mind the bit of frost and snow and in for no. a snack. Um, I'd say a lot of other people do though. Yeah. Some very unpleasant uh, weather on the way for a lot of the province. Actually, let's have a look at our satellite and radar shot first off. Now we can blame all of this bad weather on that swirling mass you see off the coast there. That low pressure system is what's uh, causing all the problems for both Labrador and the island in terms of uh, snow squalls and wind and snow. So here we are at the west coast. Uh, some snowfall happening there as well as on uh, the Avalon Peninsula. Things really ramping up tonight. We have a wind warning in place uh, for the entire south coast of southern Avalon right through to Port of Bass and up on the eastern portion of the northern peninsula there. So gusts up to 100 uh, tonight and into tomorrow, along with some snow squalls on uh, the south coast there, especially we also have a snow squall wa watch in place for the Bay St. George area. So all of those areas could see about five centimeters of snow or as much as 15 centimeters of snow in the highest, uh, most dense squalls. Uh, we also have this winter storm warning in place for the Corner Brook area up through Parsons Pond. So it's going to be very windy very messy. Uh, they are starting tonight and into tomorrow. The heaviest snowfall tomorrow looking at about 10 to 15 centimeters for coastal areas. So like the Corner Brook area should see those amounts. And uh, but as you move inland, the upper terrain, the mountain areas could see up to 50 centimeters of snow. So it's going to be very uh, windy and messy there tomorrow. And then tomorrow night is really when the northeast coast is going to be affected and the, the Bonavista area. So the winds are going to start to ramp up to gusts of 100 uh, tomorrow. During the day, it's going to be very windy as well, but tomorrow night in particular. So for Labrador, we have lots on the go along the coast. We have the blizzard warning in effect for the Hopedale, Makovic area. That's where most of the snow will fall between 25 and 45 centimeters starting tonight. Heaviest snow tomorrow. And we also have a winter storm warning for the Cartwright area, Eagle River, 20 to 40 centimeters of snow there. It's going to be very windy. Visibility is going to be very, very low. If you don't need to go out tomorrow, probably want to stay home if you can. We also have a blowing snow advisory uh, for the southeast uh, portion of the coastline there. So this is how it's all going to play out. You can see uh, this uh, low pressure system bringing all the snow to shore uh, for Labrador and as well for the west coast. So those are the areas that are going to be hit hardest in terms of the snow. Uh, and for tonight, we're looking at about two centimeters on the Avalon Peninsula, two to four centimeters along the coast in those squalls. But as I said, could see up to 10 or 15 centimeters of snow in those areas. Five to 10 centimeters expected in the Corner Brook, Gross Morn area to fall tonight. Very windy along the coast, about five centimeters of snow falling for central areas, the Grand Falls, Windsor and Gander area. For Labrador tonight, the 10 to 15 centimeters for the Makovic area is going to be the heaviest snowfall this evening with those strong, strong winds for Lab City looking at some cool wind chills tonight minus 39 overnight tonight so very 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 cold risk of frostbite for sure so tomorrow this system just sticks around and continues to swirl around and cause a big mess especially for the west coast and for coastal labrador you can see there so for uh the avalon peninsula we're looking at some morning flurries but then that should clear off going to stay very windy though throughout the day going to stay that way for much of the week actually windy as well for the northeast 
east coast where that wind warning is in effect. Not a whole lot of snowfall there, about two centimeters expected there on the west coast, five to 15 centimeters uh, along the coast in the Corner Brook area tomorrow, and then 25 as you move inland. And winds staying pretty strong there as well with gusts up to 80, 100 along the south coast. In the straits, looking at about five centimeters of snow for the Mary's Harbor area, but as we start to move up the coastline, that's when the snowfall is going to start to get heavier. So the Makovic area, looking at about 10 to 20 uh, centimeters of snow with high, high winds uh, tomorrow. And that wind chill in Lab City is going to stay very cold at minus 31. Now, all of this wind is going to be sticking around, unfortunately. I'll get into those details later. Well, it was one of the biggest highway vehicle pileups in this province's history. Last week, 15 cars and uh, three transport trucks crumpled together on the Trans-Canada Highway. This happened just east of Deer Lake, and a family from Conception Bay South got caught up in that crash. While there were some injuries involved, they were mostly concerned about their little dog. Here now is Mark Quinn has their story. As emergency vehicles rushed to a 15-car pileup near Birchie Narrows last week, the party family was right in the thick of it, fighting to keep everyone safe. Dean and Tanya Party were in this car with their two sons and pet dog, Obi. Another vehicle had crashed into us. And it was at that point that I, I started to panic and I felt we need to get out. We need to get out now. Um, other vehicles are coming. We're gonna get squashed in this car. We're gonna get really hurt. In the rush to escape, they were separated. And as more cars piled in, Obi went missing. Tanya Party climbed up on a snowbank to look for him. There was another vehicle there in the snow where I last saw Obi. So I, I called and I called and I yelled and I, I whistled and I dug in the snow and I looked under vehicles and I, I truly felt that if he was there and he, he would have came. And Party kept looking even though her foot was broken in three places. I didn't have time to concentrate it on that. I had to make sure that my boys were okay. I, 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 felt I needed to look for the dog and I also needed to get the boys off the scene because there was there was a lot of things there that really nobody needs to see. Heartbroken, the family returned home to CBS, but then a social media post struck gold. Someone saw Obi next to the highway near where the crash had happened. My husband was sitting right next to me and he said, there's a flight to Deer Lake in an hour. What do you think? Should I go? And I said, I think you should. So he ran out the door, went to the airport, jumped on the last seat on that flight, and uh, flew to Deer Lake. Obi had been in the woods alone for five freezing cold nights. Somehow he survived, and Dean Party found him. Tanya broke the news to her sons, Joshua and Jonathan. I said, Dad, he's got Obi, he's got Obi. And we all, we cried, and we cried, and we cried, and we probably cried more then we cried the night he was lost because we were so devastated. The once 18 pound Shih Tzu had lost some weight, but was otherwise all right. He's gotten a lot of treats and a lot of love since he got home. <laughs> what the party family saw was traumatic, life altering even, and they say they have a lot to work through, but at least now all five of them are together. Mark Quinn, CBC News, Conception Bay South. Wow. They say cats have nine lives. Yeah, That's right? That's incredible. How, how did it manage to live? <laughs> Amazing. And it was so cold and so stormy. Yeah, I know. So many yeah. days as well. I think many dog lovers really feel yeah. uh, for that family and what they went through. All right. At least uh, Obi is home and safe. Mm -hmm. and the accident's a thing of the past. Well, we're going to stay with pet news. Now, dog lovers across the country are going to be very familiar with this growing problem in public spaces. Owners who don't pick up properly after their pets. And for those who do... What do you do with all of that stuff? Well, in Vancouver, that stinky dilemma has led to calls for special doggy bins. The CBC's Yu Gwen Senge explains. We've all seen it before, a dog shamelessly doing its business before running off, its owner nowhere in sight, leaving the pup's poop out in the open and frustrating those dog owners who diligently scoop their poop. It comes with the territory. If you're going to have a dog, pick up its poo. Like, there's not a lot to it. It's kind of black and white to me. It's just kind of gross because we all use the park and especially now with um, little ones roaming around they're a little closer to the earth. Oh, and like if you come to the park here they got 
they got garbage cans around here particularly for that, eh? There's probably not enough of the orange ones, but you're seeing them more and more. Vancouver City Councillor Rebecca Bly says it's about time the red bins designated for doggy doo-doo were in every city park. She says two and a half million dogs visit parks each year, and that means a lot of dog waste. Her two-year-old Bernese Mountain Dog Kingsley is no small contributor. I have a very large dog, and, uh, and I live by Trout Lake, and we have these red bins, but I notice a lot of other parks don't. Bly says when there are no red bins around, people end up throwing their bags in regular garbage bins. The dog waste then ends up in landfill when it should be treated at a wastewater plant with other sewage. Landfills are already full of all sorts of different garbage. Gar you know, diapers are another issue. Um, and so adding dog waste when we can easily do something different with it seems like a, a, a responsible thing for us to do as a city. Metro Vancouver staff say they already have almost 300 red bins collecting 150 tons of dog waste a year. We've rolled it out to the majority of our parks with large amounts of dog waste. Um, from, from the studies, we, we look at what's in the garbage in our parks and the ones with a lot of dog waste, we put the red bin program in. And so there might be a couple more parks that we could add additional bins to. In general, the, the red bin program's working very well. Bly thinks as the dog population grows, more can be done. One of her ideas, increasing dog licensing fees to pay for a poo collection service. But if we were able to link a dog license with our home address and perhaps check a box to say we would like a dog waste disposal bin. One thing's for sure, when it comes to dog poo, the number one goal is still getting owners to pick it up in the first place. Eva Yuguen Senj, CBC News, Vancouver. During the discussions that you had with Mr. Martin, were you aware of that when no. you were premier? Were you aware of that when I was premier? Yes. No, no, I, I don't. I didn't know. Um, I don't have any recollection of that until preparing to come here. Out of the loop in the early days. A former Tory premier tells the inquiry he knew little about the huge cost overruns and scheduling problems with the Muskrat Falls project. Paul Davis explains in just a couple of minutes.
Let's go back to the inquiry into why the Muskrat Falls project is so far over budget and behind schedule. Former Tory Premier Paul Davis says he was shocked to find out the work was over budget by hundreds of millions of dollars, even in the early days of the de development. Well, today Davis was also asked whether the former head of NALCOR, Ed Martin, ever talked to him as Premier about the impending scheduling problems, especially with the main contractor, Astaldi. Martin was always very confident in um, the work that they were doing, uh, very confident in the project. He was, uh, uh, we had lots of discussions. This is something that cabinet had discussions on at length um, before I was premier and during my time as premier. And um, he always had an answer for the concerns that were raised by cabinet ministers or the discussion that was happening. And he was, uh, he, he knew about virtually any topic that was raised about concerns or issues. And he always had an explanation, spoke very confidently. And I, I've stated before that I believe, uh, believe then and, and believe now that they, that Nalcor, Mr. Martin and Nalcor honestly thought that even though they started slow and had, had issues with the productivity level of Astaldi as being the main contractor on the, on the generation facility, that they believed they were gonna, he, and he believed he was able to get that back on track. It never happened. But I believe that, that during my discussions with him and my time there, that he believed they were going to be able to get Ostali back on track. Yeah. Well, were, were you aware that in September 2012, that's you know three or four months before, uh, before sanction, mm -hmm. that Nalcor had received a strategic risk report from Westney Consultants that first said that, said that um, the schedule for first power, I believe at the time it was July or sometime, July 2017, that there was a 1% chance only of meeting that schedule. That was uh, later upgraded to a 3% chance of meeting that schedule. Were you, during the discussions that you had with Mr. Martin, were you aware of that when no. you were premier? Were you aware of that? When I was premier? Yes. No, no, I, I don't, I didn't know, um, I don't have any recollection of that until preparing to come here. And I certainly had no knowledge of it in 2012. Okay. That would have, so there, he, he never mentioned that it was a, a aggressive schedule uh, to begin with? You know, he may have used terms that uh, acknowledged that there was pressure on the schedule and there were challenges on the schedule, but I don't remember any numbers like 1% or 3% likelihood of achieving schedule. I, I, yeah. I don't have any recollection of that. He was a masterless man with a rich, booming voice. Chuck Lewis passed away on Sunday. He was just 44 years old. We'll look back at his musical career.
My name's Rebecca and I had an LVAD implanted when I was just 16 years old. We're checking back in with people who have overcome some major life challenges. I remember being very afraid to get this procedure done. I tried to run away at one point. This is my story, a new series with segments every two weeks on Here and Now. And this is my story. Rebecca Norman, coming up on February 27th. Welcome back. Well, a stalwart of traditional Newfoundland music has died. Chuck Lewis was the unmistakable voice of the masterless men, sometimes powerful, sometimes soft, but always full of emotion. He passed away on Sunday at the Health Sciences Centre in St. John's, surrounded by his family. Musician Mark Hiscock remembered Lewis in a post on Facebook, recalling how he'd call him on stage to sing with Shannon Gunnock back when the band was first starting out. Hiscock says Lewis added an unforgettable stage presence to the masterless men, calling him big in stature and big in voice. Chuck Lewis's deep, rich voice was unmistakable. The 44-year-old played with the masterless men for decades. The band were fan favorites on George Street, but he also gave back. In 2003, Masterless Men were part of a massive fundraiser for Badger after a devastating flood. Lewis was from Badger and said it meant a lot to him to be able to help. Uh, you know, you'd like to be able to help and certainly on the other side of the coin there's, there's not much you can do to help uh, physically and so that's why I think this benefit means a lot to me to be able to uh, perform and, and contribute that way to the, uh, the relief effort. The musician had been diagnosed with cancer. In his obituary, Lewis's family says his fight against the disease taught them all valuable life lessons, to be kind to all and help anybody in need. A funeral is planned for Friday in Lewis's hometown, Badger. Well, now to a major development in the story that's been dominating federal politics. Jody Wilson-Raybould is now clear to tell her side of the SNC-Lavalin controversy to the Commons Justice Committee. The Prime Minister has waived attorney-client privilege and cabinet confidence for Wilson-Raybould. It's a move that's being described by many observers as extraordinary. Here's what Prime Minister Justin Trudeau said this morning on his way into cabinet. Uh, important that uh, people get an opportunity to testify at, uh, or share their point of view at committee. Um, as we said, uh, waiving privilege, uh, waiving cabinet confidentiality is something that uh, we had to take very seriously, but I'm pleased that uh, uh, Ms. Uh, wilson Rabel is going to be able to share her perspective. Now, wilson Rabel will speak to the Justice Committee tomorrow afternoon. She's been granted also her request for a 30-minute opening statement. Now, the waiver of privilege does not cover her communications with the Director of Public Prosecutions, and that restriction is meant to uphold the integrity of the ongoing criminal proceedings involving SNC-Lavalin. Well, cannabis edibles are moving up on the priority list for some chefs across Canada. Weed-infused drinks and food have been ranked as the top up-and-coming food trend in a recent survey. To find out what the foodie culture of pot holds, the CBC's Chris Glover headed to the Restaurants Canada show in Toronto. Even if it's a bit bumpy sometimes. Did you order this? No, I did not. No, yeah, I think he's got the wrong table. Yes. <laughs> Chefs are always looking to the future for the next hot food trend. Everywhere we go, people want plant-based. Plant-based burgers are among the hottest foods right now, but in a survey by Restaurants Canada, weed-infused beverages and food are number one and two on the list of what's next. And the up-and-comers could be potentially the next hot trends at restaurants. Are people surprised to come into your area here and see yeah. robots and weed? Yeah, yes, 100% they are. I am surprised, though. Chef Charlotte Langley curated the restaurant of of the future for Restaurants Canada. By showcasing these recipes that are standardized recipes and we're working with all of our cannabis partners, it's a really good starting point to start the education and the conversation of cannabis use in, at home. What do you think the top trends are for 2019? I'm sure cannabis is right up there. This Mississauga couple is interested in possible experimentation with cannabis in their cheesecakes. We love this show. It's, it's like Disneyland for us. <laughs> um, and we uh, come here to do 
uh, some exploration. Toronto's Board of Health says don't explore cannabis in gummy bears and candies. Today, it accepted a recommendation to urge the federal government to ban certain edibles that appeal to kids. But some entrepreneurs aren't digesting the news well. And if you don't include all forms of edibles, then you're going to get into the problem where certain forms of edibles will just be on the black market. So it's kind of... Um, strengthening the black market in a way when really you want to have full product diversity. I'm nervous. I'm a parent, but I'm also a businessman, so I, I sit on the fence there of like, do I want this or do I not want this? The bald baker keeps his line of sweets on trend. Right now, that means vegan and gluten-free, but he's already practicing with pot. I think it all comes down to the packaging and the way you actually sell your product. If it's properly positioned as, you know, an adult edible, not a kid's edible, then I think it's fine. He says once the cannabis craze is over, yes, there's a diabetes epidemic that people are starting to realize. Sugar reduction is the next up and coming trend he's watching. Chris Glover, CBC News, Toronto. Well, there's a new dance craze taking over the north. We'll tell you all about those cool moves at cold weather and wind in your latest weather forecast. One way to stay warm, stay tuned. This weather update is brought to you by Beltone, helping the world hear better. First, a weather-related story. It looks like the jig is up and it's going viral. Yeah, there's a new way to stay warm this winter. Okay, well, this is called ice road <laughs> jigging. The cool moves started in Manitoba and uh, have been moving north by storm. The very Canadian dance craze has turned into a friendly online challenge between Indigenous communities across the prairies. Mm -hmm. And local say it's a great way to uh, celebrate the northern spirit and to recognize the importance of ice roads. Mm -hmm. A lot of communities, uh, isolated ones, have uh, frozen roads, basically uh, ice sheet across the lake. The only way in or out of some places in the winter. Mm -hmm. So 
folks, mm. the ice road jig. Yeah. Plus you get to dance with dog. Yeah, who doesn't want to do that? <laughs> well, the actual roads uh, in the province <laughs> yeah. and in Labrador are pretty icy as well mm -hmm. and snow covered in many places. Uh, let's have a look at some of the wind chills. So very windy for pretty much uh, everyone on the island and coastal Labrador, but the wind chills are really cold too. Right now, the wind chill in St. John's is minus 14, minus 24 in Port of Basque and Labrador City minus 25 and going to get much colder than that overnight tonight. One quick look at these watches and warnings in place because there are so many uh, along the south coast. We have a wind warning in effect, plus all of those snow squalls, particularly if you're in the southern Avalon and the Buren Conegra area is going to be really squally uh, there tonight, as well as the Bay St. George area and the Corner Brook area up through Parsons Pond, uh, looking at a winter storm uh, warning in place. High winds gusting to 100 and lots of snow going to come down uh, tomorrow. And we also have the wind warning for the northeast coast for tomorrow night. We also have a blizzard warning for the Makovic Hopedale area. Could see as much as 45 centimeters of snow tonight into tomorrow. Winter storm warning 20 to 40 centimeters of snow there. Very poor visibility. Lots of high winds and blowing snow in the southeastern portion of uh, the coast there in Labrador. So quick look at the forecast for tomorrow. The heaviest snow looks to be on the west coast for the Corner Brook area and up through Parsons Pond 5 to 15 centimeters. But as you move inland, going to get a bit heavier there. Could see as upwards of 25 centimeters of snow and you can see the high winds on the west coast. They're gusting to 80, gusting to 100 along the south coast and uh, for the St. John's Avalon area, it's going to be very windy there tomorrow with some morning flurries. Uh, so very blustery as well as for the northeast coast. So pretty much everyone uh, is going to be seeing a very blustery day tomorrow and for the next couple of days. So the worst weather is probably going to be in the Makovic Hopedale area. 10 to 20 centimeters of snow falling there tomorrow. Very, very windy gusts up to 100. Uh, some snowfall as well in Happy Valley Goose. We have a five centimeters there and Lab City minus 19. So very chilly day there tomorrow and even colder uh, with that wind chills. So this is how it's going to play out Wednesday night into Thursday. You can see the snow sticking around on the West Coast as well as coastal Labrador. So Wednesday into Thursday, things start to clear off nicely for the rest of the island, though a few flurries there on the northeast coast Coast, but those uh, flurries sticking around uh, for the coastal areas as we get into uh, Thursday morning, nice and clear. Those winds are going to stay very high, though. We're not going to escape those. Uh, some more snowfall coming down along the coast and for the Happy Valley Goose Bay area up through Churchill Falls Thursday evening. Uh, so it's yeah, it's going to be pretty windy. I think that's the weather theme of this week is the wind for sure. So we're looking at the flurries along the coast temperatures uh, on the island minus nine in Corner Brook minus 11 Port of Basque as you move east minus five in St. John's with a mix of sun and cloud but those high winds along the coast more snowfall more high winds persisting happy values or rather Lab City looking at minus 20 as the high so staying very cold there with a mix of sun and cloud on Thursday. So Thursday night into Friday things will start to ease up a little bit in terms of the wind. Still some snow coming down along the coast, just relentless there this week for sure, but looking fairly clear uh, on the island as we head into Friday and head into the weekend. So on uh, Friday for St. John's, looking at minus six as the high, those winds are going to stay fairly high during the day, but as we get into the evening hours, it's going to start to ease. And then we're looking at a fairly nice Saturday. It's still a little bit early, but right now we're looking at a mix of sun and cloud and then and a chance of some flurries moving in on Sunday for central areas on Friday and Saturday, looking at a mix of sun and cloud winds should start to ease there on Friday uh, as well and a chance of flurries there for Sunday. So a very similar forecast in central uh, and the east for western Newfoundland, a mix of sun and cloud on Friday, bit of a cloudy Saturday expected there and a chance of flurries on Sunday, but that winds should start to ease off. And for uh, eastern Labrador, we're looking at a clear day on Friday and a chance of a uh, some flurries on Saturday, cooler temperatures, minus 10 as the high there and with more flurries moving in on Sunday and for Western Labrador, cold temperatures continuing for sure. Uh, minus 16 as the high on Saturday with a mix of sun and cloud and some flurries moving in on Sunday. And that's your forecast, Anthony. Uh, Carolyn, what may be the oldest trade in the world, it used to be the backbone of industry, but today there are only two accredited places in all of Canada where you can learn how to shoe a horse. 
And who doesn't want to know how to do that? And as we hear from CBC's Murray Zeidler, one of those programs is in a bit of trouble. Jerry Sparshu is practicing one of the oldest trades in the world. Our civilization sort of has been built on the back of, of a horse. Horseshoers, formerly known as farriers, have been around for millennia, and they play an integral role in maintaining a horse's health. So we have to put shoes on so that they maintain their soundness, so that we can continue to ride them and enjoy them, and they're comfortable and happy. Sparshu says there are about 150 qualified farriers in the Lower Mainland, and that's due in part to a decades-old training program at Kwantlen University. Farriers say there's plenty of work for them at places like this equestrian centre. All the same, Kwantlen says it's reviewing the long-term viability of its farrier training program. Kwantlen has cut the program's next intake, and the entire certificate could be on the chopping block. It's not a huge program to begin with, um, but the uh, declining enrollment is of concern to us. The Farrier Certificate is one of only two accredited programs in all of Canada. The nine-month program teaches horse anatomy, hoof trimming, and blacksmithing. And farriers like Sparshu say that's just the beginning of a lifelong learning process. Steps A through B, C, you know, seem really easy, but it, it's, a, it's something that takes a lifetime to um, really become super proficient at. The Western Canadian Farriers Association says it's on the cusp of becoming a formal trade in BC, which would ensure minimal standards to keep horses safe. But farriers say cutting the Kwantlen program would put that process at risk. This is a very traditional trade. There's a very traditional way of, of learning. A tradition millennia in the making. Marie Seidler, CBC News, Richmond. Welcome back. We're watching last night uh, an update. The captain of the Newfoundland Growlers has been suspended for seven games after an off ice brawl that happened on Sunday. Yeah, it happened on Sunday in Brampton, Ontario. The Growlers, James Melindy and Brampton's Mike Folks traded blows before the puck 
dropped. Both men are out for seven games, of course. If you're not a hockey player, you'd be in jail by now. Uh, they were fined an undisclosed amount of money. Brampton will face Newfoundland again on Friday in St. John's, but neither Melindy nor folks will be on the ice. All right. Well, wonder we wonder why. Yeah. Just enough time now to show you our viewer picture of the day. Okay. Have a look at this. Just beautiful oh, shot. Oh, that is nice. I will tell you, this is very uh, very close to the photo we had on last night, just up the road, actually, from uh, Ochre Pit Cove. This All is right. Lower uh, Island Cove, and this was sent in to us from uh, Eugene Howell, who sent us a lot of lovely uh, photos. An abandoned house in that area. Wow. And the snow coming in on that old quilt. It's just a gorgeous Nice photo. composition, Eugene. You got the quilt and the coast. Yeah, and the color. Fantastic. Yeah. And a bit of snow to remind you it's a weather picture. We'll <laughs> see you tomorrow. Have a great night, everyone. Good night. It's a day.